What do you know about Allah, the God of Islam? Muslims claim that Allah is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise, caring, merciful, and loving God. Let us find out if any of these credentials are true. Talal Arawindi Allah, the God of Islam Let us investigate the characteristics of Allah as described in the Quran and further detailed by Muhammad. Allah has 99 names identifying his attributes and functions. Muslims believe Allah is the only true God. It is he who created the universe and he alone controls everything in it. He is claimed to be the absolute ruler who governs alone. He decides the fate of everything in this world. He is unique and cannot be compared to any physical shape or image the human mind is capable of conceiving. Let us look at the meanings of some of his characters. I will take the most common ones to compare Allah's claimed credentials with what we see happening in real life. I will be looking at all powerful, all compassionate, all merciful, the knower of all, the source of peace, the loving one, the watchful one, and the responder to prayer. The All-Powerful If Allah is all-powerful, then there is no need for him to hide. One can only think of the following reasons for someone deciding to remain unseen. First, fear or mental instability. But that cannot apply to Allah as he claims to be all-powerful and all-wise. Second, ugliness or shyness. That also cannot be true, as Allah claims to be all-perfect. Third, playing games and loving surprises. This cannot be the reason, since Allah already stated in his Quran that he does not play games or have fun. The verse says, we did not create the sky and the earth and whatever is between them for play or fun. Chapter 21, verse 16. Fourth, imperceptible to the naked eye. But surely Allah can change such a status, being capable of anything, as and when he wishes. Muslim apologists may also say the human brain cannot detect Allah because he is a spirit and not an object. This is another wild justification with no evidence whatsoever. Should Allah still insist on remaining unseen, he could at least tell us why. The only justification I've heard so far is Allah knows best, or it is the secret that Allah keeps for himself. I find these excuses ridiculous, whose only purpose is to shut off thinking and inquiry. The All Compassionate, All Merciful Mercy and Compassion are characters of someone who is affectionate and kind, someone who can offer unconditional support and care. Evidently, Allah shows neither of these traits, since he enforces eternal punishment on those who choose not to believe in him. He even goes one step further and severely punishes anyone who associates him with a companion or a helping hand. 
This is what he promised in his Quran. Those who reject our revelations, we will scorch them in a fire. Every time their skins are cooked, we will replace them with fresh skins so they will experience the suffering. Chapter 4, verse 56. If Allah is all powerful, why should He be in the least bit bothered whether people believe in Him or not? Let alone inflict such extreme punishment on non believers. Muslim apologists often justify this by saying that Allah, being the sole owner of the universe, has the right to do whatever he wishes and that he always knows best. Let us see what a free thinking mind would objectively say about this. Allah, being all powerful, does not need to resort to retaliatory measures such as imposing an eternal hell for sinful creatures. They were of his own making, and if they turned out to be nuisance, Allah could surely deal with them in the blink of an eye. Why punish and torture them forever? Threats usually come from those who need to prevent anticipated danger or harm. Allah, the supposedly untouchable being, has not been harmed or been exposed to any danger. So why is he being so defensive in the first place? The Quran is full of severe punishment threats for non-believers. Allah even goes one step further to commit himself to filling hellfire with his creatures, both human and the so-called invisible jinn. He says, had we intended, we could have given every soul its guidance. But inevitable is my word that I will fill up hell with men and jinn together. Chapter 32, verse 13. Allah has chosen not to give each soul its guidance, but instead, he commits himself to filling his hellfire with humans and jinn. Why? Where is the justice in such a decision? One would expect Allah to say, for those who happen to be at fault, we shall help them to get on the right path and keep them away from mischief. If they believe in me and have trust in me, then I will bless them for that and reward them for it. But if they choose not, then I would leave them to their choices. Here is another verse that describes hell as a greedy beast. We shall ask hell that day, are you full? It will answer, are there still more? Would you have any more? Chapter 50, verse 30. And here is another one where Allah informs us that the best fuel for his hellfire would be human bodies and stones. Then fear the fire of hell, the fuel of which is men and stones, kept ready for the disbelievers. Chapter 2, verse 24. Even the so-called angels will have a great joy in torturing the disbelievers, as mentioned in the Quran that says, and if you see the angels, when they are removing the souls of the disbelievers, hitting them 
on their faces and their back taste the agony of the burning for what you have brought upon yourselves. Chapter 8, verses 50 and 51. How could any of these verses indicate kindness or mercy? Therefore, it can be concluded that, first, Allah cannot be all merciful or compassionate. Second, if Allah needs to punish, then he is unfair with his degree of punishment. Third, Allah appears to be a personal God with a sadistic nature, deriving pleasure from burning his creatures and making them suffer for eternity. The knower of all, the perfectly wise, the just. If Allah knows everything, then he must know that some of his people will end up being wrongdoers, irrespective of how much guidance or warning they have been given. Knowing of their ill fate, Allah should have stopped them from going down the wrong track. That is the least that could be expected from the God who claimed to be the just and the perfectly wise. If Allah knows all, then he would know how every living human would act. So why would he allow those doomed to be bad to carry on and commit dreadful deeds? If testing us were the objective, then trying us would be useless, since Allah already knows what the result would be. What about our free choice to exist in this life? I do not recall Allah giving me or anyone such an option before he finalized his so-called divine plan in which he decided to let billions of people be doomed to hellfire. I would have expected this to be Allah's priority when he started the alleged creation of human beings. Allah could have easily given everyone this offer. You can exist, live on earth, and do whatever you like, but there will be rules of which you would be fully accountable for. However, you, my human creatures, need to know that I have decided to keep secret the two things I see clearly in my crystal ball, how good or bad your behavior will be, and the timing of your death. Now, the decision is yours. You can opt out or take the risk. To simplify this issue, particularly to Muslims who cannot relate to the concept of having a free choice to exist, let me give you the following example. There is an advertisement for a candidate to take part in an experiment in which the result could be fatal. But if the experiment were to be successful, the reward would be worthwhile. One would expect the candidate to be told of the consequences and be given the option of acceptance or refusal. Otherwise, it would be considered utter deceit or abuse. It would also be useless and a complete waste of time to carry out the experiment if the results were known beforehand. Here is another verse that has really puzzled me. And say, the truth is from your Lord. So whoever 
wills, let him believe. And whoever wills, let him disbelieve. Indeed, we have prepared for the wrongdoers a fire, whose walls will surround them. And if they call for relief, they will be relieved with water like murky oil, which scales their faces. Chapter 18, verse 29 Is the God of Islam telling us that we have a free choice to believe or disbelieve? Or is he saying it does not matter what we do, for eventually he will do what he wants that is filling his hellfire with wrongdoers and disbelievers. The Source of Peace, the Loving One How can Allah be the source of peace when he instructs one group of people, so-called believers or Muslims, to kill and wipe out another group of people? labeled as non-believers or infidels. One could argue that the non-believers are serious sinners who have disobeyed Allah and deserve to die. In this case, it would make sense for Allah not to have created them in the first place. Besides, a just God would not punish the non-believers twice. First, by taking away their earthly lives, and then by sadistically torturing them in the life thereafter. Apart from a few verses stating that Allah loves those who believe in him and do good deeds, there is hardly a verse in the Quran that talks about love. On the contrary, the Quran has some 130 verses that reflect Allah's anger, hate, and severe punishment for those who do not believe in him and believe in Muhammad as his prophet. Let us look at some of those Quranic verses where Allah categorizes the non-believers as his worst enemy and the lowest of the low. Here are some examples where one can see the kind of love that the God of Islam has in mind. The first verse says, and kill them wherever you overtake them and expel them from where they had expelled you. Chapter 2, verse 100, 191. Second verse, the punishment for those who fight Allah and his messenger and strive to spread corruption on earth is that they be killed or crucified or have their hands and feet cut off on opposite sides, or be banished from the land. Chapter 5, verse 33. What a sadistic penalty Allah has imposed on those who oppose him and his prophet Muhammad. They must be crucified and have all their limbs cut off. On top of that, they will be continually tortured in life after. One wonders what benefit Allah and Muhammad would gain from such mutilation. It seems like the sort of things, it seems like the sort of thing serial killers or sick individuals who have been twisted by severe childhood abuse would do to their victims. Islamists justify the above verses as acts of self-defense. 
but I can give you three reasons to label such justification as totally false. First, Muhammad was certainly not defending himself when he killed all the men, some 800 of the Bani Qurayza tribe. The Bani Qurayza tribe mass killing took place after the tribe's unconditional surrender. According to Muhammad, he was simply implementing divine instruction and certainly not defending himself. Second, the 43 killing and assassinations ordered or supported by Muhammad to silence people who mocked, insulted, or cast doubt on him. None of the victims physically attacked Muhammad, forcing him to defend himself. Third, more than 100 brutal attacks and invasions were undertaken by Muhammad and his followers during his lifetime. None of them could be considered an act of self-defense. Muhammad's rival did not start the fighting. They simply would not buy into his divine revelation claims. They saw his religion as a collection of myths, fabricated stories, and hijacked commonly known ethics, most of which were taken from other religions. In his Quran, Muhammad paid little attention to peace, passion or love, since these elements were missing in his childhood. Muslims apologists often refer to hadith which show Muhammad to be a kind and merciful man. Examples of these hadiths are a woman entered the hell fire because of a cat which she had tied, neither giving it food nor setting it free to eat from the vermin of the earth or the vermin of the earth. Second, a believer to another believer is like a building whose different parts enforce each other. And the third, the best of you is the one who is best to his family, and I am the best of you to my family. Such statements can clearly be considered as purely fictitious and absurd. This is because they are in direct contradiction with Muhammad's oppressive actions, as well as the violent and vengeful inclination which he displayed for the major part of the 23 years during which he claimed that he was the chosen prophet of Allah. Another instruction from Allah to Muhammad was to fight the Christians and Jews who do not believe in Allah's revelation and those who did not testify on what Allah and Muhammad had stated to be unlawful. The verse says, fight those who do not believe in Allah or in the last day and who do not consider unlawful what Allah and his messengers have made unlawful until they give the jizya willingly while they are humbled. Chapter 9, verse 29. This verse has nothing to indicate that the God of Islam is a source of peace towards other religions. Notice the exception here. It is okay. For the Christians and Jews to retain their beliefs, providing a sum of money is paid, a special tax called jizya, for their protection. Surely this is a blackmail, as 
the non-believer may well choose to be left alone to manage their own protection. But Islam does not grant such an option. We saw this happening in Egypt and Iraq between 2012 and 2014, where churches were savagely attacked and destroyed because Christians would not agree to pay jizya. Here is another example of how Allah reacts to Noah's request to have mercy on his drowned son, who, according to the Quran, did not believe in his father's divine message and refused to board the ark to be saved from Allah's punishment of the non-believers. Noah was hoping that Allah would respond positively to a loving father's plea, as the Quran says, and Noah called to his Lord and said, My Lord, indeed, my son is of my family, and indeed, your promise is true, and you are the most just of judges. Chapter 11, verse 45. Surprisingly, Allah, instead of welcoming such a request from a distressed father, rebuked Noah, reminding him not to interfere, for he, Allah, knows better than anyone else. This is what Allah's reply. He said, O oh Noah, indeed he is not of your family. Indeed, he is one whose work was other than righteous. So ask me not for that about which you have no knowledge. Indeed, I advise you, lest you be among the ignorant. Chapter 11, verse 46. I found this scenario very strange and far from showing Allah to be the loving one. This alleged event would raise two serious questions. First, what harm would it do for Allah to respond to Noah's request, supporting one of his most loyal prophets? Second, why is Allah blaming Noah, knowing that Noah did not know what Allah had in mind. One would expect Allah to be sympathetic and comfort Noah from the shock of losing his son, not to make him feel worse. The Watchful One If Allah is constantly watching over us, how can he let so many bad things happen to people. There are all kinds of suffering, disease, deformities, oppression, war, and the starvation of millions. One wonders if Allah is also watching those people who are enjoying all their luxuries and unconcerned with what is going on around them. Is it fair of Allah to make some people suffer and others happy and joyful? Muslim apologists have a weird justification for this. They say it is Allah's wisdom to expose mankind to all kinds of suffering, to test their faith. This is what the Quran says. Have the people supposed that they will be left alone to say, we believe, without being put to the test? Chapter 29, verse 2. And the Quran also says, He who created death and life to test who is among you is better in conduct. Chapter 67, verse 2. Allah claims to be the all-knowing, yet he has to test people to find out if their behavior is good or bad. 
it just doesn't make sense. If Allah is the watchful one, then he should have interfered long ago to put an end to all our suffering and the endless abuse by evil people. For the last 1400 years, Allah has been threatening retaliation on wrongdoers, but only in the afterlife, and even then, disbelievers will be his primary concern. The Responder to Prayer Allah promised to answer people's prayers. The Quran says, Call upon me and I will respond, or I will answer your prayers. Chapter 40, verse 60. But there is no real proof that Allah ever responded. The current Syrian conflict has claimed hundreds of thousands of innocent lives and resulted in the worst destruction recorded in modern history. It is the country where I was born and lived for many years. The Syrian are good, friendly and hard-working people and they certainly do not deserve such horrendous suffering. I'm not here to discuss the conflict's root cause. In my opinion, ignorance, greed and religion were behind it all. I just want to say that since the conflict started in 2011, Allah must have received countless prayers to help those who have suffered. But Allah appears to care not a bit. Worse than that is the pathetic justification Muslim apologists have given as an answer to this. And that is, Allah knows best. Conclusion Looking at Allah's declared credentials and comparing them to what is happening in life, one can see a huge conflict between the two. Is the God of Islam worthy of the names all-knowing, all-perfect, just and merciful? Or is he an imaginary obsessive God who hates anyone who disobeys him and who disagree with Muhammad or who disagrees with Muhammad? Is Allah a passionate and loving God? Or is he a God who enjoys burning people alive and making them suffer for eternity? This is the end of today's presentation. More details on this topic are available in my book, The Islam Delusion, that you can obtain from my website, w www.trawindi.com Goodbye for now and I will see you shortly for my next presentation.